Do you need anything? I'm talking with Eddie. We can't hear you. Cannot hear you. Anyway, you know, could you deal with that with Liz? Unless you, so Liz, could you make sure to go into the Zoom room? Okay. Hello. Liz? Oh, no. Well, we could hear you now. Okay, great. The only people I should be admitting right now are you, Eddie, Liz, and uh, Chuhi, right? Okay, Eddie, so this is the run of the program, so the program agenda, right? And then in terms of the questions, so Bell, actually in, in there is no slide. Could, could we incorporate the slide of, again, Asians just, um, you know, we have a high education attainment, but have low um, pro pro probability of management. At least I want to put that out there. Okay. Thank Wait, you. can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear okay, you. Okay, okay. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. Ethan, when do you want me to put the slides up? In the welcome? Belle, did you say something? I said, when did you want me to put the slide up? Right at the beginning. I just okay. want to, at the beginning, just, you know. And maybe we have the flyer of the youth at work or on the website, either one, so that when we say, you know, we launched this youth at work program because. Okay. So, Eddie, so here's a set of questions, right? Yeah. So, we're we just going to go by that order, but I do want to, and I guess our, we will end the QA at 547. Eddie, are you there? Yeah, here. Okay, so we'll continue to ask back and forth. Okay. And then from there, you know, um, we'll go from there and then, where's the questions? So let me just look here. And one of the things that I do wanna ask, did you ask him where he was during the LA riots or you know, how was he impacted or any thoughts about the LA riots or? Um, I did ask him, but. Was he equally like nondescript or whatever? No, no, he, he was, his because I think his family, lived, I think his family's from the Hacienda Heights area and they owned like a liquor store. Um, damn. So he did have a story to tell or something. I think so, yeah. Okay, maybe we start off with him. Oh. You want to start start with that question? No, just I mean, oh maybe. Yeah, maybe let's just get out of the way in a sense. Mm -hmm. Because I will be opening. Hi, <laughs> we'll be opening about the um, the LA riots. So maybe we could. Yeah. start off well i think we still need to ask about them right who they are right yeah 
which maybe, you know, it should be maybe towards the end then. Okay. So we'll just go back and forth on based on just this role as it is, okay? Okay. Hi, hello, Sergeant Kim. <laughs> Hi. Uh, we have Eddie here um, and my staff, Belle and Liz. Um, Eddie, is uh, Peter Long also gonna join us? Uh, he'll probably just be watching, but not as like a panelist. Got it, or got it. Like so just um, Eddie Yen uh, is in the CEO office. Uh, he's an attorney uh, for the LA County, but he's also the president of the LA County Asian Employee Association too, as well. So great. And we're just waiting for a, a Captain Kim uh, from the LA County Sheriff's Department. So actually, excuse my ignorance, but how does the ranks go? So there's the chief, assistant chief, deputy chief, Mm -hmm. Commander, and then, uh, yeah, commander, and then uh, captain. Captain. Yep, and then uh, after captain is lieutenant, sergeant. So in between lieutenant and police officer, there are sergeant, sergeant two, detective three. Uh, there's several. So there's several detective ranks: one, two, and three, and then sergeant one, two ranks, okay. and then uh, pol police officers three and two. Uh, and then your P1, our police officer one, who's uh, in training, just out of the, fresh out of the academy. Okay. But you're the officer in charge and your group is, there's eight of you, you said, right? Uh, 10 of us. 10 of you. 10 officers and then myself. Okay. And then in terms of female, how many female are in the that unit? In or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, air support uh, division. So within the umbrella of air support division, we have patrol, which is our main uh, kind of our bread and butter, and uh, we call that ASRO. And ASRO is an acronym for uh, Air Support to Regular Operations. And then uh, within Air Support Division's umbrella, there's uh, my unit, which is the specialized. Uh, we we mainly deal with surveillance, um, surveillance, and then any kind of uh, SWAT uh, warrant operation, uh, VIP transports. Um, we take the big helicopter up and SWAT repels from it. And then we have a 12 passenger King Air fixed wing uh, airplane. So I oversee all that. And then, um, uh, so within the division itself, there are now three female sergeants, which mm. is, that's never happened before. In fact, there wasn't a female supervisor until I, got, well, there was, there were, I think one other before me and then I got there and then there are two other um, female uh, supervisors who are also pilots. So there are three of us and then one other line pilot. And then we've got another pilot uh, in training. Okay, great, great. So five. Five of, thank you. Wow. So <laughs> women, there's progress. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see also Eric Kim, Captain Eric Kim. Uh, welcome. Nice to connect. Um, I don't know if you met Sergeant Jana Kim, um, but want to make sure you guys see each other as well. So, yeah. and my yeah. staff here, Belle and Liz, and I know you already know Eddie. So, yeah. um, like, oh, sorry about that. No, my, my apologies. I just want to uh, recognize that Peter's on on the line right now too. Oh, oh yes, Peter. <laughs> Peter is with Lasea with the county as well. So, um, should we? I can admit them all whenever you're ready. I think we should, right? Don't you think? All right, um, good evening, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Hei Pin Im, president and founder of Faith and Community Empowerment. Welcome to our face of AAPI Career Pathways uh, speaker series, Let's Talk Law Enforcement. Uh, we have a great panel of speakers, uh, some pretty cool, exciting stuff. I, I've learned a few opportunities that I didn't even know existed. Um, I think for many of us as Asian Americans, 
Uh, law enforcement is not something that many times our parents put on our radar screen, but again, uh, I, I learned a few things myself, and I think you'll be excited to learn of the awesome opportunities that are available. Um, at this time, I want to share that, you know, for us, there is a growing um, um, increase in the anti-Asian hate, and this April 29th, <coughs> is the 30th anniversary of the Los Angeles riots. And I believe perhaps historically that may have been the largest anti-hate uh, violence uh, for our community. And you know, where over um, 3,600 fires happened and out of the 3,000 plus businesses, over 65%, 2,300 uh, were uh, businesses were destroyed who were Korean American. Uh, in addition, um, there were over 50, 63 lives uh, that were killed um, and um, 12,000 arrests. So for many of you, I'm sure perhaps you may not be aware of the LA riots, but definitely, you know, LA burned up and all hell broke loose. Um, and really a lot of communities, I think, were pitted against one another. It took over 4,000 federal troops to come in and restore peace. Maybe it was even 5,000 with the National Guard. Um, and so again, for particularly the Korean community, a lot of times um, they say the black Korean relationship and tension. And I think the media really hurt in terms of amplifying um, the tension that existed between store owner and black customers. And in addition, um, I would say the failure of leadership and also law enforcement uh, in being able at the leadership level, not the people on the ground uh, who really uh, failed to protect um, and really allowed the riot to grow into the proportion uh, that it ended up being so. And so again, you know, for us as an organization, uh, we have been working long to ensure that there is greater um, truth uh, about many of these store owners, I think that would help facilitate true allyship, particularly between the Black and the Asian community. And so um, we are running and launching a, a Saigu campaign. Saigu means April 29, uh, the date that the LA riots broke out in Korean language. And we just had a major press conference um, on Tuesday with the mayor, with all the key media. And this coming April 29th at the LA Tapestry Church, Tapestry LA, uh, we will be bringing together several hundred people, including elected officials, former gang members, uh, people who help to protect the store victims, and, and we'll be also honoring uh, the heroes of hope. And so we just want to give you a flavor of what we did for the 20th anniversary, um, and then we will start the rest of our program. April 29, 1992 is a painful memory for many Angelinos, but it's a day that also helps define Los Angeles as it is today. At the Glory Church of God, hundreds of people gathered, folks from various communities to remember that fateful day 20 years ago, when one of the worst urban riots in U.S. history began after four LAPD officers were acquitted in the brutal beating of Rodney King. Really with joy and with love, that so many community members could uh, share their gifts and talents and be able to share the wonderful stories of humanity, diversity, and strength of LA. Korean Churches for Community Development hosted the event in what's being called Saigu, Korean for 429. It was a tragic day, but we thought, you know, for the 20th anniversary, let's create an opportunity to transform that meaning that day. Many people believe the riots made LA and its people stronger. It forced communities to better understand one another by communicating, making sure everyone is on the same page, reducing the tensions of the past in order to move forward. It's what the Saigu campaign is all about. That's why California Forward was a major sponsor of the event, supporting the work done by everyone, including elected leaders, to elicit change. What's beautiful about LA is we're proud of our diversity, you know, we feel good about the fact that we come from every part of the earth. We just got to remind ourselves that it's important to reach out to a stranger, to do more for people uh, who've been left behind, to, 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 to give a helping hand and to, to make the investments that we need so that every community has the same access to opportunity. 
Learning from our mistakes and bridging that gap between all communities is what will allow LA to heal. The city has come a long way, but the work is not done. And we, we have to make sure that uh, the genius and the wisdom of the Korean community and the genius and the wisdom of the black community comes together to solve problems for the next generation. We are one race. There is no such thing as an Asian race or African race or Latino race, or indigenous race, or Caucasian race. There's only one race and that's the human race. That we all came together, finished this part of the journey, gives me hope that for the next steps, we do have a future together. But today does not mark the end of the Sayugu campaign as we rebuild the American dream together. This is just a continuation for another 20 years. For California Forward, I'm Cheryl Gachuiza. So I hope that you will join us. I believe that some of the tensions uh, between the Black and Asian community has rose, risen from the idea that we are white adjacent, that we are privileged. Uh, unfortunately, that is not necessarily true. And part of the work that we're doing today uh, in terms of this mentorship speaker series and our uh, AAPI Career Pathways Youth at Work initiative is to bring some of these opportunities that are not available to our community. And so, Bell, could you just show a PowerPoint? Yes. So again, I think some of you may have seen this, but really, you know, for our Asian parents, they they really encourage us to get uh, high education attainment. And as you can see, oh no, this is the other slide. Could you show the other slide, Bell? You'll see here that we have the highest rates of, of education attainment compared to any group, whether it's bachelor's, master's, professional, doctor degree. And you would think that this would translate into success in the workplace, but let's go to the other slide. But you'll see that it, even in the private sector in blue, Asians have the lowest rate of being promoted to management at 55% for Blacks, 65, for Hispanics, 74, and Caucasian, 111%. For federal government in green and universities, you know, there's more regulation, so you, should, they would, you would think there should be less discrimination, and that's true, especially for Black and Hispanic, if their promotion rate grows up, grows, uh, but unfortunately for Asians, it's even lower. And again, one of the things that our parents may fail to realize is that, you know, after you graduate from college uh, and you enter the workplace, really mentorship and having access uh, and knowing and understanding the roadmap to getting promoted and succeeding is another set of skills and resources that often, again, because we're perceived as being privileged, that we are left out of those opportunities. And so this initiative is something that we have been launching. Uh, we fought for two years. Uh, the LA County youth population, I'm sorry, the LA County AAPI population is 17%. This program that we'll share a little bit later on you know, you get paid $15 an hour from ages 14 to 24 um, in a job placement program. It's an amazing program, but only 3% of the participants were AAPI. So there's a huge gap between 17% and 3%. So us speaking up and advocating, now we're able to bring this resource to you. So if you're interested in this opportunity, please stick around to find out how to sign up. Uh, but this speaker series, again, is to provide some smart advice, right? So that it's kind of like getting a cheat sheet <laughs> of a test ahead uh, from really wise individuals who have uh, come this way. At this time, I want to introduce Eddie Yen, who is the president of the LA County Asian Employee Association. He's a partner, and we're very grateful for his leadership. Eddie. Thank you, uh, hey, Finn. Um, I just want to thank FACE again for uh, reaching out to the LA County Asian American Employees Association uh, to create this program. Uh, and what we want to do is we really want to highlight those type of occupations in government uh, that the parents of uh, Asian American kids may not think of. And I think this is a great opportunity to bring in, you know, people like, uh, uh, you know, Sergeant Kim and, uh, and Captain Kim. And the last time we had attorneys from the, uh, you know, public defender's office and the district attorney to come in to explain what they do. Uh, I don't think when I was young, I don't think I've ever heard about these occupations. It was literally just doctor, lawyer, or business person, right? And my mother always told me, you know, you can always learn to be a business person, but when you go to school, you got to go to school to be a doctor or a lawyer. 
uh, and I ended up actually being a lawyer. Um, but it's uh, not to say that there aren't other opportunities out there. And I, I think some of the information that uh, you've just provided, Hapen, really highlights some of the um, uh, differences of uh, probably the information that uh, our parents tell us. And we really want to show and educate uh, the youth who are out there the potential and the opportunities that are there. So thank you again for uh, FACE for inviting uh, Lasea to this uh, opportunity to share, collaborate. Uh, we are looking forward to many other uh, sharing other occupations out there. If there are any um, youth out there or parents out there who are interested in us bringing on other speakers, please you know, email FACE and we will try to reach out to people in those areas. We also have contacts in the federal government as well as the state. So we could go out to any uh, other government agencies, uh, not just limited to a city or a county. Thank you, Eddie. And at this time, um, we want to do a quick intro of the Youth at Work Internship Program and how you sign up. Bell. All right. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Maribel Johnson. I'm on staff with FACE. Um, so like Hapen mentioned, our, uh, this event is a uh, part of our Greater API Youth at Work Career Pathways Initiative, uh, which offers LA County youth, so hopefully all of you, um, who are ages 14 through 24 with paid job training and internships for $15 an hour for now 160 hours uh, per year that you're available. Uh, eligible. So uh, you can continue to do it every year until you age out. And like I mentioned, it's for ages 14 through 24. Um, the way that you can apply, if you haven't already, um, is to do these two steps. Okay, so if you haven't done these two steps already, you got to do them, okay, to participate in the program. Number one is fill out our interest form, FACES interest form. Number two is to fill out the county's application. Um, so, and, and that's a separate link, which we'll put both of these links um, in the chat room, but um, I wanted to go ahead and mention them, sorry about that. Um, and uh, when you fill out the county's application, please make sure to list um, FACE as your referral source. Okay. And that way we can continue to advocate for you um, as we move through the process. Um, and then if you haven't heard back from them after you apply through the county, if you haven't heard back from them within two weeks, then we ask that you do so, uh, that you um, email us at FACE, um, and then we can step in and advocate for you. If you have already applied to the county, you've already done these two steps, and you are and you still haven't heard back from the county's uh, AJCCs, then please um, reach out to us at FACE. And I'll put the email that you can reach out to us at in the chat room. It's pathways at facela.org. Um, and then Finally, if you are interested in interning with FACE, with our organization, we ask that you do those two steps, fill out those two forms, but then also send us your resume indicating that you want to intern here and we can go through the process of uh, interviewing you and expedite your internship here, um, get you started. Um, now, I, I'm having a little bit of technical issues um, trying to pull up this video. Um, so while we figure that out, Hayden, do you want to go to the next thing and I'll try and pull that up? Sure. Okay. Well, at this time, um, well, before we go on, um, part of the reason why we're telling you to call us and to apply to directly to us first is that really like in life, a lot of times it doesn't work the way it's supposed to and you need advocates <laughs> to step in. <laughs> and so this is like a lesson Life lesson number one, right? Um, and so again, we want to take you to success and that's why we're asking and advising. And so make sure you listen and you stay connected with us, okay? Um, it's a fantastic opportunity and you'll get the video of, of one of the interns. Um, again, it doesn't have to be with our organization only. It could be part of the sheriff's department. It could be the public uh, defender's office. It could be the recreation park. It could be Old Navy. Uh, it could be a nonprofit. So there's over 600 slots, uh, employers, right? So stay connected with us and see what opportunities may exist. 
Okay. Also, I right. have that video well, ready now, right. the testimony. Okay. So um, we are now going to hear from um, our uh, most recent intern at FACE. Her name is India Mitchell, and she's going to share about her experience interning with our organization through the Youth at Work program. Hello, my name is India Mitchell, and I'm an intern for FACE LA. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be a part of such an amazing organization. Hapen, Maribel, and Liz have created a wonderful work environment that made me feel safe and cared for. This internship has taught me social skills and how to work well with other people. It also taught me professionalism and how to stay organized. They taught me that there is always a solution to every problem and to have patience. While being in the office and observing them, I can see how hard they work and how much they love what they do, and I'm so grateful that I can be a part of that. Thank you. All right, so you kind of got a little taste of, of that potential experience. At this time, uh, we will now go to the moment we've been waiting for, our illustrious speakers, right? So, um, and uh, Eddie Yen will be my co-moderator. So we have our two speakers today and you'll get to know a little bit better about them. And so to my left, we have Sergeant Jana Kim. She is Sergeant to an officer in charge of the LAPD Air Support Division Special Flight Section. A little bit later on, I'm gonna say, what does that mean? <laughs> um, and then we also have from the LA County Sheriff's Department, Captain Eric Kim. He is a captain of custody support and investigative services. So with that, I'm going to start off by asking, tell us again, a little bit about your job and for many of the youth, perhaps Sheriff and LAPD, they kind of have an idea, but maybe not. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about, again, your role there, but also maybe something cool and hip, you know, that maybe they don't know that is uh, neat about your job as well. So with that, uh, Sergeant Kim, Janet Kim. <clears throat> Hello. Um... Yeah, my name is Janet Kim, and I am uh, currently assigned to uh, Air Support Division with the LAPD. Um, I've been with the department now 24 and a half years, and I've uh, been at Air Support Division for coming up on seven years. Um, yeah, and then uh, I, I spent uh, the last four years of my time at Air Support Division uh, in what we call ASTRO, and that uh, is an acronym for Air Support to Regular Operations, and that's everything related to patrol. Uh, we fly 20 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. So there's always, there are always two helicopters up in the air within the city of LA, sometimes in the county as well. Um, and uh, now for the last two years, I've been the officer in charge of special flight section um, yeah, I, I immigrated to the States when I was four years old. And like most of us who immigrated here, came with pretty much nothing. Uh, grew up in Houston, Texas, uh, and I came out here in 91, uh, transferred from the University of Texas in Austin to Biola University. And uh, after college, I was figuring out what I'm going to do with my life. And um, I thought I was going to be a teacher, a professor, and realized that it was a little too boring for my personality and uh, you know my activity level, so uh, so I looked into actually uh, got a lesson in, in flying a helicopter one time and I was stuck. So the only department that uh, I were the only department that I found, in, and this is you know a, a search and rescue, fire departments, police departments, you know sheriff's departments. The only department that actually will train you from the ground up is LAPD, uh, at least back then. And I think it's still currently uh, like that. So um, yeah, so I joined the LAPD and this is where I'm now. <laughs> so thank you. So again, you basically pilot a helicopter. And so when we are seeing some crime on TV, you might be up there uh, flashing the the, the broad spotlight of people who might be running away or maybe a, a what is a car chase or such. Is that correct or no? Yes. Yes. So for the four, first four years um, working patrol, uh, I was over many of those pursuits. I worked at night. So even more, you know, a greater probability of being 
over those pursuits. So I'm the pilot and um, I, I'm on the, if you look at the helicopter from the inside in the cockpit, the pilot sits on the right-hand side and then the tactical flight officer sits on the left. So I'm in a sense, I'm kind of a glorified Uber driver who takes the, <laughs> the TFO, the tactical flight officer, where we need to go in an officer emergency or, or you know, backup, a pursuit, any kind of uh, high risk type of a, a, a scene. And that ta tactical flight officer really is the one who does the majority of the work. He talks to the guys on the ground. He coordinates all the units that respond and basically brings calm to a very chaotic situation. So yes, I am the uh, glorified Uber driver <laughs> in the air. Well, I know that what you have been able to do is, you know, we will talk later, but is it elite of the elite of LAPD. So again, we're very excited for you and honored that you could join us and share some of your wisdom today. Uh, that's Thank wild. you. And now I want to turn to Captain Eric Kim. Captain, uh, please share us uh, also, you know, your title, your job, and, you know, what do you do and, you know, something hip and cool that maybe, you know, the students would kind of have a better understanding of what you do. Well, um, I'm currently a, I'm currently a captain. Uh, I oversee right now custody support services and custody investigative services. So, in a nutshell, what that is 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 um, the brains of of the operation of custody division. Uh, so, I deal with all new policies that are being written because the laws are changing, um, public record acts requests. I deal with. Um, any new technology that might be coming out that we're trying to develop. Uh, and the other side, which is the more of the fun side, I also oversee investigative services. So any crime that occurs, any death, any murder that occurs within the jails, any of the jails, any of our seven facilities, um, I have um, about 30 detectives that handle all those cases. Uh, we, we do everything from the, the initial investigation to the search warrants to the filing. Um, and that oversees Operation Safe, Safe Jail, that oversees my organized crime task force. So that's, that's the fun side. That keeps me occupied quite a bit. But, but I've only been in this position um, for about four months. So Prior to this, um, I was the captain at Men's Central Jail. So Men's Central Jail is the infamous jail of um, LA County. It's pretty well known. Um, interesting fact about that, it it's, it's, looks like Alcatraz inside. It's an old jail with old uh, iron bars, just like how you see in the movies. Um, we've held people from Charlie Manson to OJ Simpson to now Harvey Weinstein, um, inside wow. the central jail. So it's even the Night Stalker. So it's, it's got a lot of history and um, it's a very interesting place to work because it's very dynamic, it's very fast paced. A lot of people don't understand how much activity goes on inside the jail, but it's the largest jail in the, in the world and it is just dynamic every day. It's fast paced. Um, I was there for about a year before that. I. I was an uh, executive aide for one of the chiefs over here. Um, I bounced around quite a bit. I worked patrol for about 13 years. Um, during that time, I worked three different stations and um, I, I, was, I had an opportunity to become a field training officer. I, I did investigations. I worked on one of the major crimes team. Um, but unfortunately, when you promote the captain, you don't have a choice of where you go. So you get selected to go wherever they tell you to go. So uh, I'm here and I, I enjoy it. I really do. This is a, a really cool job. I always see about 350 ish people. So um, it's a really interesting job. Um, I guess um, very, very similar to, to Janet. I, I grew up immigrant family. My parents came here. They were actually very young when they came here. They, um, I guess my family's a little different because my family, my mom and dad came here separately before they got married and they actually met in the United States and got married in the United States. Mm. So my brothers and I were all born here in the United States. Um, the one thing that I don't like about it is I lost a lot of the culture in the language and this and that. Um, I think as I got older, I started to develop more interest in the culture. Um, but um, just like um, any immigrant family growing up, you, you tend to hang out with other immigrant families. And that's kind of like my childhood. I grew up in an area with heavily Hispanic, 
um, or, 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 or black. And that's the people that I grew up and became friends with. Okay, well, we'll be asking a question about the LA riots a little bit later on. Um, but uh, so I know maybe you said as captain, you may not have a choice where you, what division, but you know, when you do become sheriff in the future, you will have all those choices um, as well. So we, we aspire to see you there um, as well. All right, Eddie, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Sure, uh, so I think, you know, uh, I'll start with uh, Captain Kim on this and, and Sergeant Kim, I think you may answer, have answered this in your uh, response, but hopefully we could uh, maybe get some additional information on this. And it's a very simple question and it's uh, uh, Captain Kim, how did you choose your job or did your job choose you? You know, um, it's a little bit of both. Um, so I was in college and at that time in the, in the 90s, late 90s when I was getting out, there weren't a whole lot of jobs, and especially government jobs. And my initial goals were to go to the FBI. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an FBI agent and travel the world and do investigations. And, uh, but they weren't going to hire me right out of college. That's just not how they do it. So it was either go and get an advanced degree or get some work experience. And I had a friend that was working with the sheriff's department at the time. And he's like, hey, you need to come on. And I, they were hiring. They're one of the few agencies at the time that were hiring. And I, I got on in 1998. And after doing it for a couple of years, it was just hard to leave. It was just very hard to leave. And then life just sort of happened. And next thing you know, 24 years later, I'm still here. And um, I, I'll never uh, change it for the world, though. It's, um, I think early in my career, I actually thought about leaving the department and going to a smaller agency. Um, I'm glad I didn't, though. I'm really glad I didn't. Uh, the opportunities that the sheriff's department has for any, especially um, an Asian American like me, you know, I was, I remember doing my tour when I was going through the hiring process and I was talking to a young deputy that was, hadn't been on that long. And I remember him telling me with the department, the sky's the limit on what you want to do. If, if you put your mind to it and you actually work hard, you can achieve whatever you want. And you see it throughout the whole department. You see people that, you know, that are pretty consistent with a, a certain goal and they end up achieving it. And I think, um, for those reasons, I'm really glad I stayed with the sheriff's department and not gone to, to a federal job. So, great. Yeah, that, I, I don't. Yeah, and I think sometimes that's not really uh, that's not what you hear, at least in, in in our community about law enforcement, right? I think there's just a lack of knowledge of what it even means. And I know when we've had our discussions in the past, where you told me about all the various departments, there's there's more than just law enforcement and just the the purposes of patrol, right? And I think that's what uh, you know. We want to let uh, the youth know is that there's just more opportunities than just being, you know, boots on the ground, you know, walking the streets. There's other roles that law enforcement has. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, uh, Sergeant Kim, kind of same answer, uh, same question. Uh, don't know if if. Uh, yeah, Sergeant Kim has an interesting uh, story, so please share, Sergeant Kim. Um, yes, yeah, so when I was, so my husband and I have been married uh, 20, uh, 24 and a half years. We basically got married the Saturday before I got into the academy, uh, February of uh, um, 1998. And um, when we were dating uh, for, uh, as a birthday gift, he, he, his, one of his buddies is a, is a, a, a pilot, um, a, a helicopter instructor. And um, so he took me up on, on a ride and it was in one of, one of these little uh, Robinson R22s with the doors off. It, it was like a go-kart up in the air, basically. That's what it felt like. And uh, after I went up in this helicopter, I thought, my goodness, there's gotta be some kind of job where I can fly a helicopter. You know, I, I rode, I've been riding motorcycles since uh, I think it was 1989. It's been a very long time. Uh, and so, you know, I, I I like uh, to kind of go fast and the great thing about being up in the sky, there are no lights and there are no parked cars. So we got nothing to crash into, but anyway, that's a little side joke. But uh, I, I went up in the air and I thought this is, this is exhilarating. I loved it. Um, then I started doing research and really the only, only place that I knew that they would train you from the ground up was, uh, is and still is the, uh, the military. So I thought about joining the military um, and uh, that, that wasn't going to happen, at least not with my uh, 
fiance. <laughs> so um, after calling a bunch of different places and organizations and even private entities, uh, LAPD really kind of attracted me because, you know, um, the, uh, they, they said, you get experience as an officer, come up as a tactical flight officer. And after you've done that for five years, you are eligible to apply to become a pilot. So I applied to, well, I, and, and between the time that I started my research and, uh, you know, within probably the next couple of years while I was going through grad school, I uh, met several people, both at church and, you know, just kind of ran into, uh, randomly, if you will, ran into people who were officers with the LAPD. And specifically, I met several women who were uh, on the job. You know, my image of uh, police officers was definitely different. I've actually had very negative uh, interactions with police officers while I was going to college, you know, at Biola and, and LAPD officer, motor officers, in fact. Um, and if I were to share you that, it would take a, a while to share that story. But you would think, man, I don't, how on earth did you even think about becoming a cop? Um, and I never did. Prior to all this, I never, ever thought about law enforcement. So uh, I met a few people, I met these women, they love their job and they talked about the flexibility, the, the, the benefits and, and like the captain said, you know, pretty much the world is your oyster, whatever it is that you have interest in, you can pretty much find it in these large departments like LA County or LA City, um, uh, LA uh, uh, PD. So um, I looked into it, I decided, okay, you know, LAPD is offering you know, I was a poor college student at the time, so I didn't have money to put myself through uh, flight school. So I decided to join the LAPD. <clears throat> and, you know, it's funny because when I, once I became a police officer, the idea of like, you know, like I got to become a, a, a pilot kind of went out the window because the job itself is so rewarding. It is so much fun. It's a different day every day. And it is an, it's an exciting job. It's, there's never a boring moment, especially when you're out in the field, you know, out in the streets. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't matter what I was working. I just, I felt like, you know, it's where I, I, I know this is like my calling. This is where I need to be. So I, I loved every minute of, of my, my career. And, and then, you know, uh, throughout my career, different people came along, various uh, mentors and whatnot. And, you know, I, I actually made it with uh, air support and I, I honestly have my dream job. I have no intentions of promoting any anymore because I think this is pretty much it until I retire. So, so well, it sounds actually, like you actually chose the path because you knew you, you want to be a helicopter pilot. So you knew this when you said that to train you from the ground up, you knew that LAPD would take you uh, would take you towards that path as opposed to going into the LAPD not knowing exactly whether you would end up being a helicopter pilot or not. Yeah, I, you know, it, yes, I, I initially joined because, because of, it was financially, really, in all honesty, it was attractive. Like, I didn't have to go and spend uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, getting uh, my, my pilot's licenses. Um, and if you look, and I did my research, I mean, it would have cost me I don't know, probably close to $100,000 in the end to get to um, the rating that I have now. But um, I, I did apply as a police officer to air support. Uh, and admittingly, I, I was not prepared for that, uh, for that interview, that oral. And uh, so I didn't get it. And then a couple of years after I applied, I got on the sergeant's list and I ended up promoting. And then when I became a sergeant, so the pool of officers is probably 70 plus um, police officers. And among the 70 plus police officers, about 60% are pilots and then the rest are uh, tactical flight officers. So you've got, you know, the division is, is 80 plus people and that's including all the supervisors uh, who sworn. And so once I promoted to sar the rank of Sergeant, I, I honestly thought, okay, that pool is even smaller. There's like no chance that someone like me, you know, will, will end up getting a spot like that because, you know, these are, these are supervisors who had much more time on the job than me. They have military experience. They've got, you know, all kinds of specialized uh, wazoo, uh, you know, experience. And uh, I honestly didn't think I would have a chance. 
Um, and that kind of was on the way uh, by the wayside. But all, all I did throughout my career is just focus on working hard at whatever job I, I got, you know, I got into. And so by the time it got to, yeah, I became a sergeant, uh, a, a lieutenant that I knew that was at air support division remembered me from previous jobs and remembered that, you know, I, I've, I've got a great work ethic. I have a great attitude when I'm at work, never negative, you know, not negative Nancy, you know, and uh, he, he remembered me. And so he reached out to me when spots were coming open and uh, told me, hey, you should, Janet, you really should consider applying. And that opened up uh, kind of a window for me to, uh, uh, you know, focus and uh, work for that job. Wow. Got it. Got it. Well, all I could say is to uh, two, two, two words: Magnum PI and Airwolf. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Sergeant Kim, you actually kind of answered a part of the question that I was going to ask. Um, but if I know that you also shared about the dreams that you used to have, love, I think it'd be amazing for the students to hear that. But I know that also beyond the sergeant reaching out to you, you also took some steps to, you know, get promoted to your position and also get into your role. So perhaps you could elaborate on both. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, when I was a kid, uh, I would have these, these dreams and it would, it would be, it wasn't just once or twice. It was kind of on a regular basis, maybe once every few months or something like that, where, um, I thought, you know, like after watching Superman or, or these uh, uh, flying superheroes, um, the dream would be a scene of, of, of me kind of flying through these buildings in a city at night. And um, so, you know, th these were the dreams that, that, that I had as a kid. Uh, during flight school, and it was really, most of it was really after flight school when I started working at night and I was flying through the city. And, uh, and I remember thinking to myself, man, this, this feels like deja vu. I've seen this picture somewhere before. And it wasn't until a little while later that the, the, it clicked. Like, you know, those dreams I had when I was a kid, I mean, it's like it came true. You know, I, I fly around the city at night, you know, with, with the, uh, through the buildings and whatnot. And so, um, it, you know, and to me, that just kind of solidifies that uh, I'm where I I'm supposed to be. Um, when I was uh, contacted, um, and this lieutenant told me, "Hey, you know, I think you you would be a good fit here, and you should apply." Um, you know, I, I I I'm one of those people. Like my personality is one that if I set my mind on something, I, I'm like a pit bull. I won't let go until either I get a strong no, and I know for sure this is not you know, uh, the, the, a yes is not an answer, or I will, you know, uh, keep at it until I succeed. So um, uh, as soon as I said, okay, I, I'm gonna do everything I can to position myself to be the best candidate I can be, um, I kind of put, put down my pride, right? And, uh, and I went and made an appointment with a commander who was overseeing air support division, never met him before in my life, I didn't even know what he looked like. You know, I just knew his name. I knew that this commander, Mike Williams, was the uh, person who was overseeing the, the division. And I figured in my mind, I thought, okay, when he gets a list of the, the outstanding candidates um, from the oral, that most of these people will probably just be numbers, names and numbers, serial numbers. And I figured, okay, if I can go there, introduce myself and tell him, hey, you know, I'm Jan Kim and, uh, you know, th this is my serial and, and whatnot, he can maybe put a face to that name. So why not? I'll, I'll give it a try. So I made an appointment. I, I kind of swallowed my pride and I thought, okay, I'm probably gonna embarrass the heck out of myself, but I'm gonna give it a try anyway. What do I have to lose? You know, this could very well be my dream job. What do I have to lose? So I went, met with him, we sat down and he kind of looked at me and thought, you know, and I could see it in his face. Like, what? What are you doing here kind of thing you know and so i introduced myself i sat down i said you know commander my name is janet kim and uh i just wanted you to see you know put a name to a face to the name and so when you get that list of outstanding candidates that you'll remember me and he was i guess impressed by it because um the first time i applied i didn't get the job 
Uh, and then two years later, another spot opened up and I applied again. But uh, after I didn't get the job the first time, he's the one who actually reached out to me and said, hey, I'm going to give you some advice on how to be the best candidate you can be. And, and if you're, don't be discouraged. Um, this is what you need to do. So he laid out kind of a, a, a map to, to be the best candidate. And so in those two years, I did exactly what he told me to do. And he was a mentor to me. And so I followed his guide, uh, his guidelines. And uh, yeah, the second time I applied, uh, uh, I ended up getting it. So gosh, you know, again, I think a lesson, a takeaway is first, if they say no, don't get discouraged. Um, and also again, to reach out. That was very courageous of you to just <laughs> be bold and to go and do that. And I think for many young folks, you know, um, a lot of times you might feel intimidated, um, but don't feel that way because I think there's a lot of people who would welcome, you know, giving you advice, just like this um, leader uh, in her in LAPD who kind of created a roadmap. And so a lot of times, again, in life, you don't know what to expect and having mentors uh, be able to guide you and tell you what you should do, what you should avoid, I think is a, an awesome thing that I think for many Asians, uh, we don't know to seek out. And so, you know, Sergeant Kim did an amazing thing. So thank you for sharing that. Captain Kim, so how about yourself again? You've been there 24 years. It seems like both of you have been in your position 24 years, isn't it? Right? Wow, what a coincidence. Uh, that's a long time to be at any company. Um, so, you know, the fact that you considered along the way, but you decide to stay, but even if you want to stay, you know, a lot of times you don't get the choice. So um, right. the <laughs> fact that you've been able to sustain and get promoted, what, what did you do? So I was completely happy being... Uh, just a regular deputy uh, conducting investigations. I was working on a really cool uh, task force at the time with major crimes, and we were just doing high level investigations. And I was completely happy. Um, I had a mentor that encouraged me to take the sergeant exam. And I was just like, okay, well, it's a free test. So I'll go and take the test. I ended up doing very well on the test. And then um, a short time later, I was promoted to sergeant where I, I worked a couple different stations and I worked in this as a sergeant capacity. During that path, I was a sergeant for about seven years. Um, I was asked to go and become an executive aide to one of the chiefs up at headquarters. And that kind of catapulted my, my career just by doing that. Um, I worked for the chief for about a year and it really gave me an inside, I guess, behind the scenes uh, look at how the department runs and, and and what we're actually working on, we're, we're working on like things that are going to occur five years from now, not stuff like right now. And from that point, uh, I have to work with them for a year. I, I took the test to be, uh, to be a lieutenant and I promoted the lieutenant. And so after being lieutenant, everything on the sheriff's department after lieutenant is appointment by the sheriff. So you can be a lieutenant forever. You can be a lieutenant for 20 years and never get promoted by the sheriff. Um, I got a surprise phone call from the sheriff about a year and a half ago. And he told me, I actually, when he called me, I, he says, you know who this is? And I go, sounds like the sheriff, but I don't know why he would be calling me. And I remember I, I just went for a run and I was walking up my driveway all sweaty and my phone rings and it's a restricted number. And I think, well, it's gotta be work. So I, I pick up the phone and it's the sheriff. And he says, hey, I'm just going to let you know um, I'm promoting you to captain. And I was so shocked. And when I got off the phone with him, I didn't even ask him where I was going to work. I, I go, you know, you're promoting me. And usually you would ask, hey, where am I going? But, um, yeah, I ended up landing at Men's Central Jail. And, um, and it was probably the best experience in my career um, because you get to work with a lot of the young deputies that are just starting their careers. So they're very impressionable. Uh, they're all in it for the right reasons. You can be a positive mentor. You can, you can give them good career advice. Uh, and you get to see the, you know, shiny bright eyes of all these young deputies that come in. And it reminds me of when I was young, you know, and, and that's kind of why I like working there. I really did. Uh, but, it, you know, working there was a challenge because I had over a thousand employees all under my command. So it was, it was tough. It was really tough. Um, but you know, like every captain, they get moved about every year or two years. And I got moved about four months ago 
and I'm actually in a better position, <laughs> but it, it, in, on paper, it looks like it's a better position, but I prefer to work over there. Yeah. So. Wow. Well, I want to ask, you know, highlight that you were initially, there must've been a reason why you stood out initially. And even now the sheriff, something must've gotten his attention. So what do you think that was? You know what it, um, like when I talked to the sheriff, what he had told me is he was actually impressed with the fact that I did a lot of time on the line, not just the education and all that stuff, but I had a lot of time in my career where I just worked the line stuff, nothing administrative, nothing, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, white collar. It was all the, the dirty stuff that I did for a vast majority of my career. And I think he was very impressed that I wasn't seeking promotion. I was I was doing it to take the test and it was just kind of like a natural progression, but I was completely happy, you know, working the line, working line positions. And, um, and I think uh, he was impressed by that and that's what he had told me. And that's what stood out compared to other candidates that were. That's um, very interesting that both of you actually, because I had a separate conversation with Sergeant Kim and again, having <laughs> on the ground experience versus just, you know, administrative work, which a lot, I think a lot of Asians seek, but again, having that, uh, experience. Um, it, it seems essential, especially in law enforcement um, as well. Um, the other part that I caught on was that, again, any opportunity to be near the source of power, so working in the chief's office, you get to see a lot of how decisions are made, how things happen, etc. cetera. Um, it seems like that's, that was essential also for you, and maybe relationships developed uh, in, in that space as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And you know what? I know because I, I think in Asian culture, um, the position that you hold, whether it's a certain rank or whatnot, it means a lot within Asian culture. Um, the one thing that I wanted to do, uh, maybe it was a little different, is um, I really wanted to be credible. I guess if, if I promoted, if I became a certain rank, I wanted to have something to offer the people that I supervise, you know. Um, and I, if you don't have any experience, you're never going to be respected and you're never going to really know what you're doing because mm -hmm. you've never done the job yourself, you know, mm -hmm. and I always refer to like companies like in and out or Nordstrom's where in order to become management, you got to start from the very beginning mm -hmm. and, and they emphasize that. And I think that's a reason why those two companies are successful. Right. So, um, I don't think I did anything great. I did take, have to take a test and I did have to pass the test too. So um, yeah. there's that aspect, but. Um, well, I heard both of you work about working hard, right? And doing your job, being responsible, which again, you know, is an essential piece. Um, I am going to switch gears. It's going to be a very short question because we, we're now, our time is running. Uh, but, you know, um, the Korean community, especially store owners, they're working very long hours, right? 16 hour day, they're trying to eke out a living. But during the LA riots, really the system failed and really law enforcement failed to protect them. And again, it wasn't so much the officers on the ground because it was a dangerous you know, situation, but really from the top, the leadership really did not um, make the right decisions um, to do so. So Captain Eric Kim, you know, I don't know where you were during Daily Rise, you could share very briefly and perhaps being now in law enforcement, you know, what advice, um, you know, what would you do differently or any advice or thoughts about the Korean community as even it's 30 years later. And even to this day, I don't think we've ever gotten a formal apology uh, from law enforcement of the city. Yeah, so I remember um, that. I remember that very vividly because my parents, I was in high school and my parents did have a business, not here in LA, but they did have it in an area that was predominantly Korean. And so I remember my dad telling me that they would, uh, they would be out there late at night, just sitting on the, on the rooftop, just in case. And, and um, I, I do remember that. I, I don't, um, the biggest thing that I see from all that, it, and it did transition from that point on is there, there wasn't a whole lot of community engagement at all. There was zero community before that. Uh, no one cared. I mean, and that goes to all the ethnic communities. There really wasn't. 
And I remember at the time of Sherman Block, he was a sheriff and um, he really got on board and really started to engage with the Korean community, especially out in that area. And the reason why I know that is because my parents got involved in it. My parents got involved in this organization and it was basically all the business owners in that area or residents and just to have a voice. And they, ha they had a, a deputy that was in charge of that area that they would meet with on a monthly basis and go over some issues. I think that was a huge thing. Um, and I know from that, a lot of that community oriented policing um, theories came out. And I think that's, that was all positive. I don't see it happening in that length again. I can't see it. I just can't see that happening. I think that not that there were mistakes, but I think they could have done better in a lot of different aspects. Um, but uh, we did see a little bit of it in 2020 in the summer. Um, I was a, a lieutenant and I was on one of the teams that had to go out all throughout LA and Long Beach and Santa Monica. And that was just a long summer for me. And that was a really long summer. Um, so um, yeah, I don't know if they could have, what mistakes they made, but I, I know that they could have done some things better. Thank you. And actually um, during the riot, because I did have a relationship with Chief uh, Dominic um, Choi at LAPD. When I heard that they weren't going to protect Koreatown, I sent an email saying, we don't want a repeat of 92. Please send and make sure. And they responded. And so we were very grateful. So the idea of community engagement is important. And I know that actually the LAPD reached out for next month. They want to partner with our agency for an AAPI you know, outreach evening event. And if the students, if you are interested, you are welcome to join that evening and you might be able to meet the chief or at least some key officers and maybe uh, Sergeant Janet Kim might be able to join us that night too. Uh, so we shall see. But Sergeant Kim, I know that uh, you are a student at Biola. Um, so just any thoughts related to the LAPD? Um, yeah, you know, I, I remember I, I was, I was focusing so much on school at that time, you know, I, I moved all the way out from Houston just to go to school so I couldn't flunk out. <laughs> so <laughs> I was very focused on my studies. And I remember watching that on TV, and it felt like a completely different world, even though it's only a few miles, you know, up the up the highway. Um, I, I, I don't know enough specifics about it. And even, again, you know, being a college student and not, uh, I wasn't, you know, engulfed in the, in everything that happened. Um, so I, I don't want to speak to anything that I don't have all the facts on, but, um, you know, I, I think absolutely the police department could have done, done better and maybe proactively um, have gotten in front of uh, things before it got out of control. Um, but where we are always uh, kind of, um, Walking that fine line is between uh, the freedom to express pr protest, right? To, to the freedom to protest. And then that fine line is when it goes from protest to then something violent. So uh, the topic of the, the main topic of, of what kind of what sparked that, that uh, riot. Um, you know, the police department had to allow the community to express their dissatisfaction, uh, you know, from the outcome of, of, of the trials. And for, for the police to jump in too quickly and completely stop their protest, that would have been wrong too. So in, in, in some ways, and not by, by no means am I making any kind of excuses, but uh, there, there's always that balance. And I think on that day, they, they chose to um, it seemed like, and, I, and I, I, I'm sure there was, uh, you know, uh, problems from, from uh, higher up, right, uh, in terms of the, the command staff, but uh, <clears throat> they, they chose to allow that expression, and then it, it, it got to the point where it tipped over to that, that you know, riotous, you know, kind of uh, uh, acts, and uh, by then, you know, it was, it was very difficult to, uh, to control. So, and in 2020, I was, uh, my, my TFO and I were over the riots during that very first day and uh, when it went out of control. And uh, we were there that entire, we were working at a lot of overtime, um, flying for Santa Monica, Beverly Hills and all these other agencies as well. Um, but, uh, but yes, I mean, you know, the, the command staff, um, like Captain Kim, 
you know, it would be great to, for people like, you know, Captain Kim to have that street experience. They've gone through the riots before, or they've gone through protests and, you know, violent protests and whatnot, and, uh, and have the experience to be able to make split decisions out in the field. But sometimes you have that experience and sometimes you don't. Well, we're very grateful to both of you that you're in that role and we are able to have those relationships. I think one of the things that we are often lacking is that many of us fail to speak up and engage and show up in many of these, again, meetings. Um, so I do want to say that we want to share one of our other programs. It's called the C2 Leadership Institute. We have a program for pastors and leaders, but we also have one for young adults. And so we want to just uh, highlight that right now of another youth that participated, um, and then we could take it from there. So Belle, could you share about the C2 Leadership Institute? these past 10 weeks, there are no words to describe the gratefulness I have for Miss M and for KCCD for not only taking me into this inspiring journey, but for also believing that in myself and in my church that I have capabilities that are waiting to be unlocked. From learning how to do public relations, to learning about public policy, to just finding our voice with the help of God's word, this Leadership Institute has helped allow me to dip my feet in so many different areas to ultimately better my church and my community. Um, Ms. M, from simply working as an intern for you um, at the office. It stopped. Um, I can't imagine where I would be without your Leadership Institute just keeps on growing. It's gonna keep on being more successful and it's going to be a blessing to so many more people. So we invite you to uh, visit our website. Uh, Bell, maybe you could put the address uh, for those of you. Um, if you uh, desire to grow in leadership, right? And to be a, a resource for the community and to be able to build relationships like with Sergeant Kim or Captain Kim or be Sergeant Kim or Captain Kim uh, in the future. Um, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, Eddie, for joining us and partnering with us. Thank you, Sergeant Kim. Thank you, Captain Kim. I wish that we had even more time because I feel like we were just getting into real interesting stuff um, as well. For our students, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be doing this on a regular basis. Um, I'm trying to recall what whether it was the fourth Friday, I believe. Um, yes, it is the fourth Friday, so please reserve your calendar. Um, and in the future, if you do have questions, please put them into the chat room and we'll be able to then allocate time for you to ask questions. And I'm wondering, uh, Sergeant Kim or Captain Kim, um, if students would want to reach out to you, would that be something that would be okay? Yes? Okay, great. So for our students, if you're interested, please uh, send us a note and we'll be able to pass on the contact information. So thank you. Have a wonderful evening. God bless each one of you. Thank you again, Sergeant Kim and Captain Kim. Take care. Thank you.